uh, I didn't know this. I didn't know exactly what it was going to be. And Stephan, of course, they had no idea what I was going to speak on. But the Lord really impressed it on me to preach on being dead to sin. And it fits perfectly with all of this. And uh, anyway, I don't know any way to segue into this. But this, man, this is, you know, you don't really know how to live until you overcome a fear of death. You know, I was watching a, a documentary on uh, John Wesley this morning when I was exercising. And John Wesley was ordained an Anglican minister and he came to the United States in the 1700s as a missionary. But he wasn't born again. He didn't know the Lord. He was just religious and he was very, very strict. He and his brother Charles had started what they call the Holy Club at Oxford in England. And I mean, they were so strict. He had even taken a vow that he would never get married and he just wanted to be totally dedicated to the Lord. But as he was traveling to America, uh, they came into a terrible storm and he uh, threw up, lost all of his food and he was literally petrified of dying. And in the midst of all of that, there was a group of Moravians that were on the ship with him. And these Moravians were just worshiping the Lord and they had peace and it bothered him tremendously. And he saw that they had something that he didn't have. And it was because they weren't afraid to die that he recognized he did not have what they had. And so he came to uh, the U.S. and he actually pastored a church and it didn't last very long. He didn't see... I think he saw one convert and he eventually uh, basically got run out of America and went back. And when he got back to England, he thought he would check out these Moravians. And he went to one of their meetings and they were reading Martin Luther's uh, uh, introduction to the gospel of, uh, or to the book of Romans. And as they were reading that, he finally realized what happened. And he said that he felt his heart was strangely warmed. And that's when he got born again. And it, was the, and it was his fear of death that revealed to him that he really did not have a relationship with the Lord. And when he got born again, it was totally taken away. And as they portrayed in this thing, that's not to say that, you know, anybody looks forward to death or uh, that we uh, look forward to the pain or anything like that. But you have to recognize that, man, there is not only this life. This is very temporal. And so many of our problems come from the fact that we are just focused on this temporal life. You know, nearly every word in this performance was scripture. It might have been modernized so that it's in our language, but this was nearly all the wording of Paul. And he said that for him to live as Christ and to die as gain, that he was already crucified. Did you know you can't intimidate a dead person? <laughs> Paul had already died. Paul had died to his life and because of it, there was no fear in him about what people could do. They could threaten to kill him and he'd say, great, for me to live as Christ. And they'll say, well, we'll lock you up. And he says, great, I'll get all of the jailer and everybody else saved. And they say, well, we'll turn you loose. And he'll say, great, I'll go preach the gospel. <laughs> you know, you can't intimidate a person who's already died. And the truth is that through Christ, we have died with him to sin and to everything else. That's done in the spirit realm, but the problem is our mind doesn't always know it. And we get occupied just with this life. And again, there were so many things said in here about, you know, that it's not this temporal life. Everything that you see is just temporary, but it's the things you can't see that are eternal. And brothers, I want you to know that the truth is we are a spirit being. And we hear that and we say that we understand it, but the truth is very few people live from their spirit. Very few people live from who they are in Christ. And this is what God laid on my heart to share this week, even before I saw this, is to just help you recognize what your true identity is. Did you know many of you, if you were coming here and if I had not meant you, but if somehow or another we were on the phone and if you were to call and I say, well, how will I know you when you get here? You could describe yourself, how tall you are, whether you're uh, you know, hefty or whether you're skinny and you could describe yourself whether you have uh, dreadlocks or whether you're bald. Amen. <laughs> and you could describe this physical person. And if I was to ask you, do you have 
you know, what kind of personality do you have? You know, you can describe yourself, whether you're outgoing, whether you're shy, whether you're boisterous, well, you know, you could describe a lot of things. But if I was to ask you who you are in the spirit, most people draw a blank. And yet the true you is the spiritual being on the inside. This is just like the vehicle that we get around in. You know, I remember one time Jamie and I had just bought a brand new vehicle. We went to church and the first day we drove that car to church, a woman backed into it and dented the door in and we were just about to get into the car. And when she saw that it was me, she just was crying. Oh, I'm so sorry. I can't believe I damaged your vehicle. And I said, look, it's just a car. I said, I can get it fixed. And she was, oh no, but it's just terrible. And it's, it's just a car. You know, we may like our cars and we take care of them and wash them and clean them and do things like that. But did you know, it's just a vehicle and you can get another vehicle. That's all that this body is. This is just the vehicle that we get around in. This is not you. It's important. You can't live in this world without this vehicle. And so we got to take care of it and we've got to do the things that we need to do. But this is not the real you. And when this body dies, that is not the end of your life. It's just the beginning. And that is absolutely true. Again, this was portrayed so well. But the real you is inside. And sad to say, most of us are trapped in this physical realm to where we only know ourselves in the physical, we don't know who we really are in the spiritual. If you could ever see who you really are in the spirit, I guarantee you, you would be a transformed person. The truth is that in the spirit, you are identical to Jesus right now. This isn't what uh, you're going to be like in heaven. It says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, it says, herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Man, those first two phrases right there, I could preach on that for hours. Most of our love isn't perfect because we don't know who we are. We aren't bold. We're fearful many times because we're only looking in the physical realm and seeing the things that could happen to us in this physical realm. But herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, speaking of Jesus, so are we in this world. It didn't say, so are we going to be in the next world. It says, so are we in this world. And most people, when they hear something like that, they'll immediately go look in the mirror and they'll think, this is like Jesus. <laughs> no, your physical body isn't like Jesus. We've got all kinds of things, zits and gray hairs and bulges where we shouldn't and things like that. This physical body is not the part of us that is like Jesus. And the scripture says that we're going to receive a glorified body. But right now, this is not the body that we're going to have throughout all eternity. And you can search your emotions and your mental part. And I guarantee you, that's not like Jesus. Many of us have so many fears. Uh, many of us are smarter than others. We understand more than others. There's all kinds of differences in this physical, soulish realm. But in the spirit, you are identical to Jesus right now. That's what it says. As he is, so are we in this world. Your spirit right this moment is identical to Jesus. And it's not identical in the sense that you're a baby and that you've got to grow up. You'll hear this many times. People will talk about, you know, we are born again, but we're just a babe in Christ. That's talking about your mental emotional part in your ability to comprehend and flow in it. But in the spirit, you are identical to Jesus right now. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 17 says, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And the Greek word for one there is hes, H-E-I-S. And that means a singular one to the exclusion of another. It's not saying like God's up here and you're down here. He's complete and you're like him, but you're growing into him. No, in the spirit, your spirit is right this moment, the identical spirit. If you're born again, your spirit is the identical spirit that it's going to be throughout eternity. You aren't going to get more of God. You aren't going to have to be washed off, cleansed, injected with more power. Right now, you have the exact same power that's on the inside of you that is inside of Jesus Christ because it is his spirit sent forth into our hearts. Galatians chapter four says it's his spirit sent forth into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. 
Romans chapter 8 verse 9 says, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, well then you aren't truly born again. When you get born again, it's not just changing your belief system a little bit. It's not you believing things concerning Jesus versus a Muslim believes things about Muhammad or a Buddhist about Buddha or something else. No, it's a change in the heart. You get born again and you become a totally brand new person on the inside. And it's not some have more of God than others. Every one of us that is born again has the identical Spirit of Jesus Christ. As He is, so are you. You are identical to Him. There is no variance in our spirit whatsoever. The only variance in here is the ability to understand, to believe. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If you are born again, you've been changed into the very image of God. You've got resurrection life on the inside of you, but you've got to know it. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free is what Jesus said in John 8, 32. What we don't know is killing us. And I'm telling you, brothers, that God has changed you. If you are born again, you are identical to Jesus. You have the same power that raised him from the dead. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. Paul prayed a prayer that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened, that we might see the hope of our calling. What is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us? The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You have the same power on the inside of you that raised Jesus from the dead. And I know that there's a lot of guys that say, well, that's true for Todd because we've seen him operate in the miraculous and people get healed. And you might believe that somebody else has this power. And we believe only certain people, clergy people or something like that. It's not true. Every single man in here, you have the identical power on the inside of you that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You do not have to go to somebody with their collar turned around backwards to get them to touch you and to do something for you. Every one of you have the exact resurrection power of Jesus on the inside of you. The only thing that's stopping it, it's got to flow through your brain. And we don't know who we are. We don't know what we have. This is what changed my life. I experienced the love of God and it was wonderful. But, and it was a wonderful experience. I don't mean to discount that any at all. It got my attention and it lit a fire on the inside of me, but I didn't understand any of the things that I've just told you. I was in love with God and I knew he loved me, but I couldn't understand why he loved me because there wasn't anything lovely in me and I didn't understand. And the thing that changed me is when I began to understand who I was in the spirit. And the Bible says in John chapter four, verse 24, that God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is not focused on your body and on your mind. He's aware of those things because he loves you, spirit, soul, and body. But it's your spirit that got changed. God is a spirit. And to really connect with God, you've got to connect with him in your spirit. You have to worship him through your spirit. And your spirit is perfect. Your spirit's as complete and perfect as Jesus is. Your salvation in your spirit is over. Did you know when you get to heaven, you're going to find out that one third of you was completely saved the whole time you were here on the earth. And you had the power of God on the inside of you. And the only thing that keeps it from getting out into your physical body is this thinking, the fact that we don't know who we are in Christ. We only know ourselves in the physical realm. You can describe your body. You can describe your soul, your mental, emotional part but you've got to learn who you are in Christ. And I don't have the time tonight, but on uh, my other sessions during this thing, what I'm going to be sharing is some people think, well, yes, I believe I was born again, but I've still got this old nature and, and you don't understand. I've been an alcoholic. I've been a drug addict. I've had this happen. I'm going to be sharing with you that you don't have an old sin nature anymore. You don't have an old man. There is not a part of you that is any more devil. Before we get born again, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 3, that we were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But now that you're born again, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 
old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new and all things are of God who hath reconciled us unto God by himself and has given us this ministry of reconciliation. In the spirit, you are completely brand new. And this is what changed my life. I believe that God existed and I knew that he loved me, but I couldn't understand how could I do anything because I only knew myself in the physical. I could describe to you my body. I can feel, you know, whether I'm hot or cold or things like that. And I could describe whether I was happy or sad. I was in touch with my body and my physical realm, my, my soulish realm. But in the spirit, I didn't know who I was. And as I began to get into these things and learn that as Jesus is, so am I. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. I have the mind of Christ. I have that same power that raised Christ from the dead. The works that Jesus did, I can do also. As I began to see that, I didn't see it in the mirror. I didn't feel it in my emotions, but I saw it in the word of God. You know, this Bible is like a mirror is what it says in James chapter 1. It says, whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty is like a man that beholds himself in a mirror. This is our spiritual mirror. You can't see your spirit. You can see your body. You can feel your soul, but you can't see or feel your spirit. You only know the spirit through what the word of God says about you. And I just learned to hold this Bible up and it says, uh, I'm blessed with all spiritual blessings. So when people ask me how I am, I'm saying I'm blessed. And they've seen me when I've been broadcast on worldwide uh, radio about this person who did, Paul Harvey said, this is the worst thing I've ever heard in my life. And he talked about what happened to Jamie and me. And, we, and that day I had people come say, how are you? And I say, I'm blessed. They said, well, I know that, but I mean, I want to know how you really are. And I said, I'm really blessed. <laughs> Amen. And I just held this up and people, well, no, I want to know how you feel. And I said, I don't care how I feel. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. I've died to this physical person. This is not what's controlling me. And you know what you saw tonight? If we could somehow or another put that into our lives so that you really did get to where you weren't controlled by what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. You were controlled by what Jesus did in your spirit. If you could ever get to where that is more real to you than what the banker says, than what the lawyer says, than what your mate says, than what somebody else says, man, it would just set you free. And brothers, I know that, man, you came here expecting something. I believe that tonight God is speaking to people. That really, I, I just pray that the Holy Spirit opens up our heart and helps us to understand. But this really is such a powerful truth that you've got to die to this self. You've got to get to where you are not trapped by the way that you were before you got saved, by the things that have been said about you. You are a completely brand new person. And I promise you, the person that's on the inside is identical to Jesus. In knowledge, you've got the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16. You've been renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created you, 1 John 2.20. You have an unction from the Holy One, 1 John 2.27. On and on we could go. And everything in you is perfect. You don't need anything. You don't need God to heal you. You've got resurrection power on the inside. You don't need God to give you wisdom. You've got the mind of Christ. All you got to do is draw it out. Philemon chapter one, verse six, Paul was praying for his friend Philemon. And he says, I pray that the communication of your faith would become effectual by acknowledging every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. You can't acknowledge something that doesn't exist. The average Christian is saying, oh God, I know you can do anything. Would you stretch forth your hand and heal me? You're waiting on God to come from the outside for Todd to lay hands on you, for somebody else to do something. And you're waiting on God to do something. The truth is he's already done it. Everything's on the inside of you. You don't need God to do anything. You need to draw out what God has already placed on the inside of you. And you do that through the renewing of your mind. I tell you, you can't just go by how you feel. You can't feel in the spirit realm. This is the 
mirror right here. Jesus said in John 6, 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. This is spirit. This is the only way you can know who you are in Christ. And you have to read this. And if it says that you are a new creature, well, then it doesn't matter what the physical looks like. It doesn't matter what your soul feels like. You have to accept that I'm a brand new person. If it says that I'm identical to Jesus, then I'm identical to Jesus. If, I can do the, if he said I could do the works that he did and even greater works, then I can do that. And you have to get to where you go by what the word says and not by what you feel. It's as simple as what I've described here tonight. It's not easy. The hardest thing you'll ever do is get to where you don't go by what you see in the mirror, what you feel in your emotions, but you go by what the word of God says. I tell you, most of us are so trapped. We're prisoners to what we feel. And it takes time to renew your mind. But Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It says that's your reasonable service. This isn't just for the full-time minister. This isn't for the fanatic. This is for every one of us. Every one of us should make ourselves a living sacrifice. That means that you die to this self. A sacrifice is where you kill something. And God wants you to die to yourself and die to your own desires and die to you, you running your life and you being in control. The Bible says, lean not unto your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Proverbs 3, 5. We are supposed to crawl up on the altar and we're supposed to give our life to God and say, God, my life is yours. I'll go anywhere, I'll do anything. American Christianity has really been diluted to where most people, it's all about what I can get from the Lord. It's all about me feeling good. But what you saw tonight, Stephen and Paul and just on and on you could go with so many people, they've laid their life down and they died. And those are the ones who laid the foundation that we're standing upon. And I tell you, the people that make a difference are the ones who will literally crawl up on the altar and become a living sacrifice to God. And then verse 2 says, Romans 12, 2 says, and be not conformed to this world. That means poured into the mold. This world is going to melt you. Every one of us have problems. Every one of us have things that come against us and you can't help but be melted, but you get to pick which mold you fit into. You can either let the world push you away from God and you can become bitter and angry and all of these kind of things like so many people are. Or when the world melts you, you can say, I'm going to be like Christ and you can get poured into that mold. So it says, don't be conformed, poured into the mold of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word transform there is a Greek word metamorpho. It's a word we get metamorphosis from. It's where a caterpillar spins a cocoon and then comes out a butterfly. You can, you can see that kind of transformation in your life. How? By the renewing of your mind. That's what the word is. This word is given for us to see who we are and what we have in the spirit. And we get to where we go by what the word of God says instead of what we feel. And as you do that, it goes on to say in Romans 12 too, that you will prove. The word prove means to make manifest to your physical senses what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God? This is how it will come to pass in your life. Brothers, I want every one of you to know God's never made a dud. God's never meant for anybody to just occupy space and die and be gone. Every one of you have the potential of being a world changer. What you see in me or in Jeremy, Todd, anybody else who's, who's ministering, you've got that potential and much, much more. There's not a one of us that has fully released it. There's not a person in here who God just meant you to be occupying space, a placeholder. God has something special planned for every one of you. Before you were even born, he wrote all of your days in a book is what it says in Psalms 139, I believe it's verse 16. God did not write just an average 
uh, day out for anybody. Every day is supernatural. I often say that if your life isn't supernatural, it's superficial. You ought to be able to look at your life and say, there is no justification for what's happened with me other than God. You know, today I had some things happen and I went back and was reading my journal from 2014. And I read three months of my journal and I was just literally overwhelmed thinking, God, there is no, there is no way that any, anybody could have done these things. It's God. There is no explanation for my life outside of God. I'm not a perfect example, but I can guarantee you that the things that God has done in my life, I can't do on my own. Right before my mother died in 2009, she was listening to all that God's doing and she stuck her little bony finger in my face and she said, Andy, you know this is God. And I said, yes, ma'am, I know this is God. And she says, you aren't smart enough to do this. <laughs> and I said, you're right. <laughs> I don't have any argument. I'm telling you that I'm doing things that are beyond myself. God is doing things for I read today about blind eyes that were open, deaf ears open. We had a woman right in that other building over there that was born deaf and she came up and I prayed with her and she was healed. And uh, that night we had two more deaf people healed. I can't do that. That's not me. But it's who I am in Christ and you've got that exact same power on the inside of you if you could ever get over your stinking thinking and thinking about yourself as I'm only human. You aren't only human. One third of you is wall to wall Holy Ghost. You have been changed. You are a brand new person and you've got to die to that self. You got to get out of the limitations that other people and that you have placed upon yourself and you got to see yourself in Christ Jesus. And if you could do that, man, the sky is the limit. The potential in this auditorium is phenomenal. I think, I, I think it was Mario, I'm not sure who this was, but anyway, somebody I heard say that if you want to find the place on the earth that has the most potential, says you need to go to a graveyard because the vast majority of people take their potential to the grave with them. There's very few people that ever live up to what God intended them to be. And I'm not saying that to discourage you, I'm saying it to encourage you that most of us are shooting at nothing and hitting it every time. We're looking for the easy way out. We're thinking, what can I do that has the least potential for failure? And I tell you, if you're just trying to play it safe, you're never going to reach God's full potential. God will call you to do something that's beyond yourself. If you don't feel like you are doing something that takes God's super on your natural if you think that you can do what you're doing and you, you've got the talents and abilities and you can do it on your own, then I can guarantee you, you have not found God's will for your life. God has something supernatural planned for every one of you. And it may not be like me. It may not be like somebody who's in ministry, but I guarantee you, he has something that he wants to do that is beyond just your human ability. You know, I was visiting with Colin Carr right down here. He's on my board and we were talking with... Todd tonight and Colin in April, I think it was 15 years ago, took a step of faith during a recession in, what was it, 2008, 2009 or something, when everything was going wrong and they started a business which everybody told them it's stupid. And here they are 15 years later with offices in all 50 states plus Washington, uh, our DC area, so that's 51. They're seeing God do things. And I guarantee you, you can't look at Colin and say that it's natural. It's supernatural. Billy down here, man, he's, he's amazing. He's a 10 talent guy and God is using him supernatural. The things that he's doing, it's not natural. And on and on, I could go right down the line talking about every single person right here. And, and every one of us have that potential. You need to get to a place where you start living out of the supernatural part of you and quit being just a mere human being. The world needs some men to stand up. We're living in a day and age where it's woke. And we've had men uh, turned effeminate thinking that it's all about feelings and emotions and stuff. We need some people that'll stand up and get beyond yourself and beyond your emotions and begin to take a stand. 
If we had this many men that would just stand up for the truth in our culture today, I guarantee you, you would transform this place. If this many people, I don't know how many is here, but there's a couple of thousand. If we had 2,000 people that left this auditorium and everybody began to start living out of their spirit and letting Christ live through them as you saw tonight, like Paul and Stephen and people that were willing to give the last full measure and stuff, I guarantee you this would shake our nation. It would shake other nations. It doesn't take a lot of people. Did you know that the United States, there was only about 25% of the colonists who participated in the war. 50% were neutral and 25 were against the Revolutionary War. It was 25% of the American population that beat the mightiest nation on the face of the earth. And on and on you could go with this. It's, all, it's never the majority. All it takes is a few people. On the day of Pentecost, 120 men came out of that upper room praising God. And here we are 2,000 years later and Christianity is by far the largest religion in the entire world. We've got millions, billions of people that have been touched by it. Not all of them are truly born again, but I mean those 120 men turn the world right side up. We've got a lot more than that. If everybody was to receive what God is saying to you tonight and if you were to start operating out of who you are in Christ, the sky is the limit. This could, this could change this nation. This meeting tonight could change this nation if every person would just open up and receive it. I'm not overstating anything. I'm understating it. I don't have the words to describe what God has shown me about this. Man, I challenge you tonight. We've got to commit ourselves to the Lord. Again, I know that many of you came here really expecting and believing for something. Some of you might, I don't know why you came, but I'm telling you that God is looking for a few good men who would just commit themselves to God. There was a revival service that Dwight L. Moody was in back in the 1800s, I think it was. And a man stood up and he says, the world has yet to see what God could do through one person who is totally committed to him. And Dwight L. Moody said, by the grace of God, I'm going to be that man. And he only had a third grade education. He couldn't even read very well. He would read a scripture and when he got to a word that he couldn't pronounce, he'd stop and preach and then start on the other side of that word so that people <laughs> wouldn't know. And yet Dwight L. Moody preached to kings, queens. He preached on every continent of this planet. He led millions of people to the Lord. God used him with a third grade education because he just decided he was going to be that person who commits himself to God. And he didn't do it perfectly, but he did more than most of us. I'm telling you, brothers, God is here. The Bible says, 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking to show himself strong in behalf of those who are perfect in his sight. Did you know that the Holy Spirit is here tonight looking all through this auditorium and the Bible says he's, he looks on the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And so God is here looking at every single person's heart and he's saying, is there anybody here who will take this challenge? Is there anybody here who will open up and make a commitment that I'm going to find out who I am and what I have in Christ and I'm going to start living out of the Spirit instead of out of my flesh. I'm not going to go by what I see or what I feel. I'm going to go by what God says about me. So help me God. And you ought to be responding by saying, man, God, don't look any further. Here I am. Amen. Praise God. I want to ask our prayer team to come up here and I'm going to give an invitation for a couple of things here tonight. But let me say that I really believe in my heart that there's some men here that you may be a very good person and you may be like John Wesley. You might even be a pastor of a church. But you don't really know the Lord. And you don't really have that assurance in your heart that you're born again. If that's you, I'm going to ask you right now to just get up out of your seat and come down here right now and let someone pray with you. And I know that a typical invitation, they'll have everybody bow their head and close their eyes. I've got some other things I want to do. I'm not asking you to come get the plague. 
I don't have to beg you to come. Man, I'm telling you that if you don't know Jesus, you need to know Jesus. And it's as simple. It's as simple as what the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that's more than just saying the word. You've got to make him Lord. Doesn't mean you're promising you'll never fail because you can't keep that promise, but you are willing for him to take over your life. You want to submit your life to him. He is your Lord. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It's really that simple. And we've got people here that we would love to pray with you. So if you have never done that, please come forward and let someone pray with you right now. If you are born again, but if you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you have to have that. Jesus told his disciples, even after he was raised from the dead and right before he went back to heaven, he said, tarry in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high, the Holy Spirit. And man, they became changed people. They ran and hid before the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But after that, they stood boldly and told the Pharisees, you judge yourselves whether we should obey God or whether we should obey man. They were different people. And sure enough, power came upon them. And there's many things involved in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to teach on it, but part of it is speaking in tongues. If you don't speak in tongues, man, the Holy Spirit will allow you to pray straight from your born again spirit, the part that I've been talking about tonight, and it will bypass the fear and the confusion that's in your brain, and it will allow you to talk to God straight in a heavenly language that doesn't have any unbelief, any uh, discouragement, fear, confusion in it. So if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which includes speaking in tongues, you need to come forward right now and let someone pray with you. And I guarantee you, you will receive power from on high. So can I get some more people down here praying with people? We got more people coming than what we got room for. So if you are, say, if you're on staff with me or if you're one of our Bible college students, would you come down here and pray with people? and help us. It, it, it's the Lord that baptizes people in the Holy Spirit. We're just going to agree with you and pray. Praise God. So you can line up here in front of the steps too and pray for people here. That'll be fine. And then you don't need to come forward for this, but I'm going to ask you personally to stand if tonight God has spoken to you and you've just been living so far below your privileges you didn't understand who you were in Christ. And you still don't have a full understanding, but tonight you know God spoke to you and you know that he gave you a revelation that he's got more for your life than what you've been living. And man, tonight you're stirred up and you're saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find out who I am and I'm gonna start living out of the spirit and it's not gonna be me living, but it's gonna be Christ living in me. If that's you, I want you to stand and we're going to pray a prayer of agreement. Praise God. Father, we just thank you for Jesus. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for everything he's done. And Father, thank you that it's not out in heaven someplace, but as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Thank you for what you've placed on the inside of us. Father, thank you that we are complete in you, that we have all of the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in us bodily. Father, we just thank you. And we pray that you open up the eyes of our understanding and help us to see what we have. Father, help us to see the greatness of your power, the same power that you used to raise Jesus Christ from the dead. Father, we want to acknowledge all of the good things that are in us in Christ Jesus. And so according to Luke chapter 24, verse 45, Jesus told those disciples, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Father, I speak this over all of these men. And we believe that you are opening our eyes 
We believe that you are helping us to see with spiritual eyesight. Father, we want to get over being controlled, limited, bound to, in prison to just our physical senses and our feelings. Father, we want to walk by faith instead of by sight. Praise the Lord. Well, the Lord's speaking to me right now that there are some of you that you've come from a rough place. You've come from some really bad stuff. And because of that, you know you're forgiven. You believe if you were to die, you would go to heaven. But you still think, how could God ever use me? You're only looking at yourself in the physical realm. In the spirit realm, you are a brand new person. You are already free. You don't have to do something to get cleansed cleansed and, and fixed up for God to use in the spirit. You're already as perfect as you're going to get. You need to turn from that old life. You need to take those verses that you are in Christ and you're a new creature. And you need to quit limiting God by what you've been in the past. Mike Pickett spoke of this earlier today that man, it doesn't matter what your past is, it's your future that counts. And right now God is revealing to you that you are a brand new person and you just need to throw those shackles off and quit being bound by the things that you've done in the past. You need to go by how God sees you, not how other people see you, not how you see yourself. Man, God has set you free. Praise the Lord. There's some of you that in your marriage, you have just felt like I can't be this affectionate person. I can't show my wife the love. This is just not who I am. I'm just a mean, tough guy. God is telling you he's changed your heart. And if you'd start living out of your heart, you can be just as kind, as loving as Jesus is because it's Jesus living on the inside of you. There are some of you that have just been unable to humble yourself and admit that you're wrong. And you're going you're gonna to live a life of deception regardless of how obvious it is. Right now, God is allowing you to just get over that. Get over yourself. And right now, you can humble yourself. There's some of you that tonight, you need to call your wife and to say, man, I have been wrong. God's just touching all kinds of people. There's all kinds of things happening in here. There's some of you that in the physical realm, in the financial realm, you've been a failure. You failed in the past and because of it, you see yourself as a failure and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And right now you just can't break out of it. And it's because you are looking at yourself and your past experiences. In Christ, you are blessed. Everything you set your hand unto will prosper if you'll just believe it. Man, there's some of you right now that your past failures in business or whatever has been broken off of you right now. I speak that that is broken and you are delivered of this right now in the name of Jesus. All you got to do is just reach out and receive it. Here's the power of God. Here's healing flowing among many, many, many people right here. Man, those of you that need a healing in your body right now, you just open up and receive. I tell you, the power of God's here. God's touching many, many people in your emotions, in your finances, in your body. Just every single way right now, God is setting people free. Holy Spirit, we receive your ministry and we receive you changing people's lives right now in Jesus' mighty name. Praise God. Somebody here that's bent over scoliosis, you can stand up straight and stay straight. Right here, you're delivered of scoliosis. It's done in the name of Jesus. Arteries that have been clogged, veins. Man, right now, God's just rotor-rooter in all that stuff and getting it healed right now. And, and I believe that all of that's gone. People that have had heart problems and the altitude has aggravated it. And right now, man, you can feel all kinds of things. It's hard for you to breathe. Right now, in Jesus' name, I just speak healing over you and command that heart to be healed. Somebody had part of your heart that was not working. Only half of your heart was working. Like half of it was dead or something like that. Here's the healing power of God right now touching you. This could also apply to somebody who's watching. Doesn't have to even be a man. You might be one of you ladies that's sneaking in on this thing. Right here's the healing power of God 
flow into you right now. And God is healing hearts. Thank you, Father. And all kinds of things are happening. Somebody here with your shoulders, uh, your spine, here's the healing power of God going up and down that spine and fixing disc. Thank you, Father. Vertebrae right now are being healed. And I can see the power of the Holy Spirit just running up and down your spine and touching people right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I don't have to call your healing out. Whatever it is that you need, just right now, begin to reach out and believe. Receive the word that was given tonight that in Christ, you're already complete. You've got God living on the inside of you. You don't need him to come just through me. He can come up out of you. Release this supernatural power right now. The Bible says with your mouth, death and life are in the power of the tongue. So begin to speak faith right now out of your mouth. Say, I'm healed in the name of Jesus. Knees, you be healed. Back, you be healed. Bowels, you be healed right now. Pain, you be gone. Sickness, disease. Talk, release this power of God out of yourself right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody here came believing for your wife. And she hasn't really been seeking the Lord or maybe she's been overcome with something and just in discouragement and grief. And you came here just really believing God for a miracle in your wife. And God spoke to me right now that that was your heart. That's what you've been praying for. And he's saying he's answering your prayer right now, wherever she is, whatever's going on, whether you are together or separated. The Lord is touching your mate right now. First Corinthians chapter seven says that the unbelieving mate is sanctified by the faith of the believing mate. And you came here believing and right now God is touching that wife. Right now, wherever she is, whatever's going on. And you need to rejoice and receive that because I believe that God is touching her right now and things are changing. Praise the Lord. And then there's other people that your wife sent you here <laughs> hoping that you'd be changed and her prayers are being answered right now in the name of Jesus. And God is changing your heart. Praise the Lord. Man, I believe there's all kinds of things happening here. There's much, much more going on than what we could ever call out. I tell you, the power of God is touching people. That's awesome. Praise God. Amen. Well, I tell you, it's been a good start. Good start. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And I've learned this, that God never serves dessert first. So it's going to be better tomorrow. Amen. So let's have Mike come back up here and tell us what's happening tomorrow. And uh, I think we've got our cafe working tomorrow and stuff. So anyway, we got great food here. If you haven't already got a meal plan, I think you can probably still get something or can they? Uh, so, the, so the kitchen and the cafe will be out there available for people. If you did not purchase a ticket for the. All right, let's turn over to Romans. Chapter 6. And you know, I've experienced this hundreds and maybe thousands of times how God supernaturally direct our paths when you acknowledge Him in all your ways. That was really excellent what Jeremy was saying this morning. I appreciate him following the Holy Ghost and getting off what his track was because that was just excellent. But he only acknowledge, it, it, that only works him directing your past if you acknowledge him in all of your ways. So I've experienced this a lot of times, but I'm still just amazed because very seldom do I ever know what I'm going to minister before I get up to minister. And there's reasons for that. That's not saying that anybody else who does it differently is wrong. It's just that's the way it is with me. But this week, I really felt like God gave me some things to say 
And I didn't know what this musical would be like, but it was just perfectly with what God had told me to say and then what Jeremy's sharing and everything. It just seemed like this is divinely ordered of God. And I believe that the Lord has a purpose. He's trying to get some things across to us. And uh, boy, some of the things Jeremy said today about uh, identity, I thought that was just excellent. So after this meeting, I'll pinch all of those things and tell people this is mine. God told me that. <laughs> it was really, really good stuff. But here in Romans chapter six, let me just read some of these verses because there's so much in here I can get bogged down with it and I want you to at least read it and then we'll be, I'll come back and comment on this this morning and also tomorrow. But in Romans chapter six, verse one, it says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if you have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we, also, we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord." Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Man, it's hard for me to quit reading because this is just so powerful, but I do want to comment on some of these things. So let me stop there. But let me start by saying, he says, what shall we say then? The word then means that this is dependent upon all of the other things that he had said in the previous five chapters. And I hadn't got time to go back and summarize this, but man, Paul, uh, Romans is Paul's masterpiece on grace. He had been attacking this mindset that God loves us because of some virtue that we have, because of our performance. And he had been showing that it was totally by grace. And uh, he had made that point so conclusively. In the fourth chapter, he showed you that Abraham and David, two of the greatest examples in the Old Testament, it wasn't their goodness. You know, if people would really use your brain for something besides a hat rack, when you read the Bible, you would find out, did you know that Moses killed a man thinking he was going to bring God's will to pass? And he wrote the first five books of the Bible and also Psalms chapter 90. David wound up killing his lover's husband trying to cover up his sin. He was a murderer and he wrote most of the Psalms and all of 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st Kings. Uh, a lot of things is written about him. Saul was the one that converted to Paul. We saw that uh, musical last night. And he's the one that wound up killing uh, Christians, persecuting them and giving consent even to their death. So what this means is the majority of the Bible was written by people who are murderers. <laughs> and yet people don't make this connection. They think that you got to be holy and you got to do everything right before God can move in your life. It's just amazing how you can miss this. The Bible is so candid, so clear about the way that it presents people. Man, it shows you that God's never had anybody qualified working for him yet. God doesn't use us because we're lovely. He loves us because he is love. And so it's clear. And so anyway, he'd been making these points. And because of that, and he was showing that God doesn't love us based on our performance. Well, then a logical question is, are you saying that we can live in sin? Because religion basically tries to motivate people not to live in sin by telling you that if you sin, God won't answer your prayers. God won't use you. God won't bless you. And there's two extremes to this. The ultra Pentecostal will say you lose your salvation every time you sin. 
And if you die before you get that sin confessed and under the blood, you'd die and go to hell, even if you've been walking with the Lord for 40 years. A lesser interpretation, but it's like a stick or something. It's just the other end of the stick. It's still the same stick. You may not go to hell, but God won't answer your prayers. He won't fellowship with you. He won't use you if there's any unholiness in your life. Both of those are wrong. And this is what Paul has been saying, that it has nothing to do with your goodness. Your goodness doesn't make God love you more and your badness doesn't make God love you less. Amen. God loves you because he chose to love you, not because there was anything of worth and value in you that made you uh, valuable to him. It was his value. It's just he chose to love us. Man, I'm not going to take time to turn over there and read it, but if you read Ezekiel chapter 16, he's reasoning with them and he says, you were like a child that was born and your navel wasn't even cut and you were rolling in the dirt. You had been thrown in the dust and I found you polluted in your own blood and yet you were precious to me and I took you and cleaned you up and made you my own. There was nothing in us that made God love us. When the Bible says that he loved us, he loved us because he's love, not because we're lovely. And so this is the point that he's been making and it brought up this question. Well, then why live holy? Because most people, the only reason they live holy is so that they can earn something from God so that they can get a prayer answered or be used or, or do something like that. So that's the reason. And he says, what shall we say then? Did you know that he said this in Romans chapter 3? He said it in Romans chapter 6 verse 1. He said it in Romans 6, 16. I didn't read down that far. And then twice in the book of Galatians, the apostle Paul, as he preached the gospel, constantly had to ask this question. Can, am I saying that we can live in sin? And the answer to it is God forbid. In the Greek, this is as close to profanity as you can get without blaspheme in some hour or another. It's an absolute, unqualified negative. No, absolutely not. That's not what he's saying. But here's the point. If you never have this question come up, can I just live in sin because God's not dealing with me based on my sin? If that question never comes up, you haven't heard the same gospel that the apostle Paul preached. And sad to say, most of the church body today has not heard the same gospel that is the power of God to set us free. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And most of us haven't heard a true gospel. We've heard some things about Jesus coming, dying for our sins, but it's tied to your performance and to your goodness. And anytime you do that, you have polluted the whole thing. Anytime you tie your goodness to God's moving in your life, then you have polluted the gospel. The gospel means good news or literally, I, I could go into more explanation, but in my opinion, I believe it means the nearly too good to be true news. You mean that God would use me even though I'm not usable? Even though I'm not a, a great person and I don't have talents and abilities and I hadn't done everything right? That's nearly too good to be true, but that's what it is. You know, I heard a story about a man one time that his son wanted to go see a movie and uh, the other kids from the church wanted to go see. And so anyway, he came to his dad and says, could I go see this movie? And he says, well, what's it rated? And he says, well, it's R rated, but it's just a little bit of nudity and just a little bit of profanity. And all of the other kids from the church, their parents letting them go, uh, can I go? And he said, no. And in order to compensate for turning him down, he says, you can, come, you can bring those kids over to our house and you can play at our house. So anyway, they came over to his house. They were in the backyard playing and he made some brownies. And he, he brought these brownies to the kid and called them all to the back door. And he says, hey, I made some brownies. Anybody want them? And man, everybody wanted them. And he says, but before you eat it, let me just tell you that I put a little bit of dog poop in these brownies. <laughs> There's not much. You aren't going to be able to taste it. It won't hurt you. Everything is fine. You'll be able to survive. But there, I just wanted you to know there's a little bit of dog poop in here. And did you know what? None of the kids would eat it. See, anytime you mix your, your poop, this is why we have a men's advance. You can't... You can't say things like that when women are present. And those of you that are bootlegging this gospel, watching it right now, 
Uh, you can't criticize me because you aren't supposed to be here. Amen. <laughs> But anytime you mis mix your goodness, it's like putting your poop up against God's and it pollutes the whole thing. It has to be 100% total confidence in Jesus and not in yourself. And if you are mixing your holiness in there and thinking, God, you're using me because I've done this and this and this. Or if you're saying, God, you can't use me because I've done this and this and this, then you have perverted the gospel. So, man, I could preach another hour on that. That's the first verse. And if you, if you haven't heard something that is so good about God loves you and he wants to use you, and it doesn't matter whether you're living holy or not, that it's all based on Jesus. This is why we pray in the name of Jesus, not in your own name, as Jeremy pointed out really well. If you, if you never have this question come up, do it, can I just live in sin? Well, then you hadn't heard the true gospel. The true gospel will bring that question out. But the answer to it is an absolute unqualified negative, God forbid. And then in this sixth chapter, he gives two reasons why a believer doesn't live in sin. It's not so that you can earn the favor of God, not so that you can keep uh, the things of God and keep God pacified and off of your case. He says the first reason right here, he says, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You are dead to sin. And with most people, this just does not communicate because they look at their life and they think, man, I can sin with the best of them. Amen. <laughs> they think it's not, I'm not dead to sin. I, I can still go out and sin. If I was to just let myself go, I could do all kinds of things. What does it mean to be dead to sin? Keep your finger here because I'm coming back. But look over here in 1 John chapter 3. In 1 John chapter 3. And in verse 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. And again, most people, when they read something like this, they just have a disconnect. They aren't bold enough to sit there and say, well, the Bible must be wrong. But they can't see it in their life, and so they just say, they, they just disconnect. And it's one of those things where they don't explore it. They don't continue to say, God, show me what this is talking about. The only explanation that I've ever heard, I've never heard anybody else teach on this verse. I'm not saying that I'm the only one, but I've, it's rare. I just have never heard anybody else teach on it. The only way that I've ever heard this tried to be explained is they say, well, this means you won't habitually sin. In other words, you might have been a drunk, you might have been a drug addict, you might have used profanity, you may have been into sexual sins, and you might sin occasionally, you might sin a little bit, but if you're truly born again, you won't habitually sin. You eventually will overcome the drug addiction, you'll overcome the alcoholism, you'll overcome your lust and things like this. If that's how you try and define this, well, then you have to put sin into categories. But did you know that the Bible puts gluttony right there next to adultery, murder, everything else? Gluttony is a sin. And did you know that you can't get fat on one meal? It is habitual. You habitually sin if you're overweight. You know, yesterday I ate at least twice, maybe three times what I normally eat, and I gained a pound. But you know, I could, I could eat until I pass out, and I wouldn't gain more than two or three pounds. You can't get fat overeating one time. If you are overweight, which I'm not trying to condemn anybody, I'm overweight, I need to lose, I don't know how much, it's been so long since I was there, but I know... I've got some weight that I could lose. I'm not condemned. I'm not condemning you. But I'm saying if you are overweight, you habitually sin. So if you're going to interpret this as this means habitual sin, well, then that would mean every fat person, every overweight person cannot be born of God. Are you willing to stand by that? Certainly that's not what this is talking about. 
You know, the real simple answer to this goes back to identity, what we've all been talking about here. The only part of you that is born of God is your spirit. Your body is not born of God. Your soul is not born of God. Now, it's got a promise that your body is going to be changed when we see the Lord. You've got a promise that we will know all things, even as also we are known, but that hadn't happened yet. Your body and your soul are not saved. But your spirit is saved and it is born of God and whatsoever is born of God can not sin. His seed remains in him and he cannot sin. Your spirit cannot sin. So put this back with Romans chapter 6 verse 2. The reason we don't sin is because when you got born again, your new spirit that you receive from God is dead to sin. It can not sin. Your nature has been completely changed and you do not have a sin nature anymore. And again, most people struggle with this because they're looking in the physical realm. Most of us are what the Bible calls carnal. Many people think carnal is just a terrible word to describe, a, I mean, a person that just hates God. Well, a person that hates God is definitely carnal, but did you know carnal just means of your five senses? You're controlled and dominated by what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. If you are only looking in the physical realm, you're what the Bible calls carnal. And it goes on to say in Romans 8, 6, that the carnal mind is not subject to God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh, which is another way of referring to being carnal, cannot please God. If you are only trying to see, what does it mean that I'm dead to sin? And you're only looking in your physical actions and you're searching your mental part you're never going to understand this because your body and your soul are not dead to sin. But your born again spirit is dead to sin. It cannot sin. There is no desire for sin in it. And so he goes on to say in verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. This is not talking about water baptism. I'm not going to take time to explain this, but Hebrews chapter 6 says there's multiple baptisms. Jesus said, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and he was talking about suffering. This isn't talking about water baptism. This is talking about when you get born again, 1 Corinthians chapter, th uh, chapter 12, I forget the verse, it's around verse 13, says that the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ. When you get born again, you get placed into the body of Christ. That's the baptism that it's referring to. And when that happened, you died to sin. Man. I've got a lot to say and it's not hard, but it's contrary to what all of us have been taught. And because of that, it just raises so many questions that to deal with all of these questions, uh, it's hard to make progress. But let me just say that when you, got, when you were born physically, you were born with a nature that was separated from God. You were born with a fallen nature. It says in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. When you were born as a little tiny baby, your spirit was separated from God. That's what the word death means in the Bible. It doesn't mean cease to exist the way that we use it. It means separate. When Adam and Eve sinned, their spirit didn't die. It was still there and it was functional, but it quit being in union with God and it started operating independent of God. And in the day that they ate of that fruit, they would die. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. And if you look it up in the Hebrew, it literally says, in the day you eat of the fruit, you shall die, die. That word, Hebrew word is repeated just to emphasize that it is absolutely certain the day you eat of that fruit, you're going to die. They didn't die physically. They didn't die mentally and emotionally, but their spirit became separated from God. When a person dies physically, James chapter 2 verse 26 says, as the body without the spirit is dead, 
So faith without works is dead also. So the Bible defines death as when your spirit leaves your body. It's not ceasing to exist. It still exists. It just is no longer in this physical body. So the point I'm making is that death just means separation. And when you were born physically, you had a dead spirit that was separated from God. It still functioned, but it was functioning actually in union with the devil. If you go on down to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, it says that we were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You were born with a sin nature. Man, I'm trying to hurry up, but I know that the things I'm saying, this is revelation to some people. This is baby stuff. This is stuff that every person ought to know, and the average person doesn't know this. Just for time's sake, I'm going to summarize the fifth chapter five different times in the last seven or eight verses of the fifth chapter of Romans. It says, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death, death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. For by one man, we were made guilty. By one man, judgment came. By one man, condemnation came. It is not your individual sins that separated you from God. I know some of the things I'm saying, people are thinking, what are you saying? Oh, Jesus, help me. <laughs> it's your sin. Did you know in the book of Romans, there are 49 times that the word sin or sins, plural, is used. And out of 49 times, there's only one time that the Greek, there's three different Greek words used. And only one time does it refer to something you do. 48 out of 49 times, it's describing your sin nature, not your actions of sin. 48 times the word is a noun, which describes a person, place, or a thing. A verb describes the action of a person, place, or a thing. And there's only one time that the word sin was translated from a Greek word that was a verb. The other times it's talking about your sin nature. It's not your sins, your individual acts of sins that separated you from God. It was the fact that we were born with a sin nature. We were all born separated from God. And the reason you sin is because you had a sin nature that taught you how to sin. It propelled you to sin. And if you understand this, it has many, many different uh, benefits to it. One of them is if you think, well, I haven't sinned as much as anybody else. If you understand what I'm saying, it doesn't matter how little you've sinned. If you are a sinner by nature, you're separated from God. And who wants to be the best sinner that ever went to hell? <laughs> We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So if you have lived a great holy life and you're taking pride in what you've done. All you've done is restrain some of the actions, some of the manifestation, but you hadn't changed your nature. You are by nature a sinner and you must be born again. And on the other hand, if you've been a terrible sinner and if you've lived a terrible life, some people think, how could God ever do anything with me? There's no difference between the person that's gone out and murdered, raped, and plundered, and me who has never said a word of profanity in my 75, I'll be 75 next month. I've never said a word of profanity. I've never taken a drink of liquor. I've never smoked a cigarette. I have lived a super holy life, but I had a sin nature that had to be taken away. And there is no difference between the person who's murdered and plundered. Now in the natural, there's a difference because you'll go to jail for those things. I'm not, I may not be punished by man. I may get along with people better because I'm not going out and always offending people. But in God's sight, James chapter 2, verse 10 says, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of all. Even though I've never gone out and committed adultery and I've never done a lot of these other things, I have broken the law. It's like if there was a big glass in front of you and me it wouldn't matter if you shoot a BB through it or if you break the whole thing, run a truck through it. If the thing is broken, it's broken. It's the whole thing's got to be replaced. God's standard is perfection. And if you weren't perfect, well, then you need a savior. And even if you have learned how to restrain your actions of sin, your sin nature is what separated you from God. And your individual acts of sin was just you indulging that sin nature. 
I didn't indulge it as much as some people did because I was brought up under so much fear that God was going to send me to hell. I used to have a reoccurring dream that I had smoked a cigarette and that I got turned into the cops and the cops turned, turned me over to my mother and I woke up in hell, burning in hell because I had smoked a cigarette. And that was a reoccurring dream. I had it two or three times a year for a decade. I know some of you think, well, I'm weird. I am. That's what religion will do to you. So religion scared me and it says that the fear of God restrains the amount of sin. Proverbs chapter 16, verse six. And so fear can cause you maybe not to do it, but it didn't change my nature. Just because I didn't do some of the stuff that other people did, didn't change my nature. I was by nature a sinner. But when I got born again and when you got born again, God took that sinful nature out of you. You do not have a sinful nature anymore. And he put within you his very nature. And you are as righteous and holy and pure as Jesus is in your spirit. And that born again spirit, the part of you that is born again, can not sin. It has zero desire for sin. It hates sin. Therefore... If you are still struggling with sin, it's because you haven't seen your new identity. You aren't walking in what Jesus has done. You have been trapped by what has happened to you, what your old man did. Let me, man, I'm talking as fast as I can. In verse five, it says, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, that's a done deal. When you got born again, you were baptized into his death. Your new born again spirit is dead to sin. And if that is true, that you have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be, notice that the first part, it's done. It has happened. But then we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. But verse six says, knowing this, You've got to know something in order to experience this. When you got born again, you were created a brand new person and you are literally dead to sin. It is impossible for your born again spirit to sin. It has no propensity to sin. It doesn't have any, it cannot sin. Man, that is awesome. But it's not going to manifest in your thought life and in your actions unless you know something. It says you have to know this, that your old man is crucified with him. This is what Paul was referring to when he says Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul was crucified with Christ. You've been crucified with Christ. Somebody says, well, I don't know that I have. If you're born again, you have been crucified. You are dead with Christ. You were baptized into his death is what it says up here in verses three and four. It's already a done deal. You're born again. Man is as perfect and holy as it's ever going to be. You just don't know what you've got. You haven't known this. So the first thing is you got to know this, that the old man is crucified with him. Some people teach, well, yes. That happened, but it resurrects every day. And I got to die to myself daily. There is no resurrection power in the devil. There is no resurrection power in your old man. Your old man does not resurrect every morning. You do not have two natures. You are not schizophrenic. Many of you look at your life and think, oh, yes, I am. Because, man, sometimes I want to serve God and sometimes I don't. No, that's not true. And Man, I don't think I'm going to talk fast enough to get over to Romans chapter 7, but I could explain that to you. That's anyway. <clears throat> no, you don't. <laughs> There's other people that we want to let minister. But your old man is gone. You are not schizophrenic. You know the only reason that you still struggle with sin? It goes on and says this right here. It says... Uh, in verse 12, I read that, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Some people think I can't help it. You can, or he wouldn't say, don't let it happen. And you know how you let it, you find out what you've got and who you are. You find out your identity and you realize, hey, that's not me. 
I'm a born again person. I'm a new person. I don't have to be that way. And then it's, it goes on to say, neither yield your members. Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Sin shall not have dominion over you if you understand these things that I'm talking about. But if you go ahead and think, but I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. And Jesus, I don't want to live in sin. I don't want to live this way, but what can I say? I'm just an old sinner. You're identifying with it. And therefore, you may give token resistance, but if the desire continues, then you just give in thinking, well, after all, that's who I am. I'm an old sinner. It's just like Jeremiah, uh, Jeremy was saying about Saul saying, who am I that for you to be saying these things? God had to give him another heart. Did you know God has given you another heart? You are a brand new person on the inside. And the key to the Christian life is recognizing that's not me. I am dead to this. And I'm not only talking about the terrible overt sins of, uh, you know, dipping and cussing and chewing and going with those that do. I'm not talking about only that. It includes that. But just your persona that, well, this is, you know, everybody in my family, we just don't show emotion. We don't, uh, you know, we're just mean kind of people. We're just real abrupt. We're real critical. Well, you're trapped by that stuff. That's not the new you. You got another part of you that is identical to Jesus, that is as forgiving and loving and caring as he is. You can read Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit. That's talking about your born-again spirit. Your nature, your born-again nature produces love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Some of you think, well, I just have a short fuse. That's just the way that they are in my family. Well, you're describing your carnal self. You aren't describing your born-again self. You're living out of the flesh and you cannot please God. But you could identify with who you are in Christ and say, I am dead to that. Maybe everybody in my family is mean and critical and they gossip and do stuff, but that is not the born-again me. I am dead to that. I will not live that way anymore. So you have to know this, that the old man is crucified, that the body of sin might be destroyed. What is the body of sin? Did you know when a person dies, as I quoted that verse already, James chapter 2, verse 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. When a person dies physically, their spirit leaves, but did you know it leaves behind the body? And for a period of time, that body looks alive. I actually have been with people who were dead and I didn't realize they were dead at first because I thought they were just asleep and then I found out that they were dead. You leave behind a body and for a period of time, matter of fact, I had a friend of mine that worked in the Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas, the hospital where John F. Kennedy uh, was pronounced dead and he, he did aut autopsies on the 13th floor. And he called, pulled a guy out of a slab and put him on a stretcher and he was getting ready to do an autopsy. And he turned around to get his instruments and when he turned back, this guy was sitting up and his arms were dangling like this and his eyes were open. And my friend nearly jumped out the 13th floor window. <laughs> it scared him so bad. He went running down the hall and yelled and somebody came in and they checked this guy and he was dead. But did you know that even after you're dead, your body has these electrical impulses and it can make a muscle contract. And this guy just sat up. Anyway, they checked him out. He was dead, didn't have any brain waves, didn't have a heartbeat. And they just pushed him back down and did the autopsy. <laughs> but for a while, you can look like you're alive. So your old man, that sin nature that was separated from God and lust for sin and lust for all of this wrong stuff. It programmed your brain how to think. It programmed you to be afraid of death. It programmed you to be selfish. It programmed you to think that if you don't take care of yourself, nobody else will. It programmed you that when you have a need to hoard and hold back instead of doing what Jeremy was talking about and giving. You were taught by that old sinful nature the wrong way to look at everything and it left behind a body, a way of thinking. And the only reason that you still are dominated by sin, worry, fear, anxiety, and on and on you could go is because you haven't renewed your mind. Your spirit is completely changed. 
Your spirit doesn't have any fear in it. Your spirit trusts God 100%. Your spirit can believe for anything. Did you know faith is already something that is one of the fruit of the spirit? Galatians 5, 23, that's one of the fruit of the spirit. You've already got faith. I've got a teaching out entitled The Faith of God. Every one of you have the measure of faith. Romans 12, 3. There aren't different measures. Every one of you were given the faith of Christ. Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. He didn't say I'm living by faith in the Son of God. If that's what your Bible says, you ought to get a real Bible. It's, it says, I live by the faith of the Son of God. If there's only one measure, Romans 12, 3, and again, I know that the nearly inspired version says that I live, that every person has a measure of faith. But uh, King James, the one that Jesus used, it says <laughs> that you were given the measure of faith. There's only one measure, and if Paul's measure was the faith of the Son of God, then you've got the faith of the Son of God. In your spirit, you have the fullness of the Godhead bodily, but it doesn't work until you renew your mind. It's got to flow through your mind to get into your physical body. And so if you're thinking that, well, I know that faith works, but I just don't have enough. I don't have any of it. You've got the faith of the Son of God. You've got everything that you need in your spirit already. But see, your old nature, that sinful nature that was separated from God, taught you how to think wrong, taught you how to be pessimistic, taught you how to see the worst side of everything, and you are going to continue to function the way you were programmed until you reprogram this mind. And I tell you, one of the greatest things that you can ever learn is that you, as the born-again part of you, is now dead to sin. It cannot sin. It's dead to that. It's dead to fear. It's dead to timidness and shyness. It's dead to worry and care. That is not your born again spirit. Anytime that you come up and say, man, I'm just so depressed, you've solved the problem. Somebody's thinking, well, what did that solve? Because your spirit can't be depressed. You're in the flesh. You're indulging your feelings and emotions and you're going by the way the old man programmed you. In the spirit, man, you are righteous and you're bold. It says in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1, that the wicked flee when no man is without, but the righteous are bold as a lion. If you aren't bold, it's because you aren't walking in the spirit. You're walking in the flesh. You're going by how you feel. In the spirit, your spirit doesn't know any fear. Your spirit's not afraid of anything. You are dead to all of this. So you've got to know that the old man is dead so that that body, the wrong thinking that it programmed you with might be destroyed. And then the result of that in this sixth verse is that you will not serve sin. Man, this is power. If you could understand, brothers, that you are dead to whatever your problems are, finances, health problems, emotional problems, relational problems, anything that you're dealing with, it's only affecting your physical body, it's only affecting your mental, emotional part, but your spirit man is perfected forever. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 and 14, you've been sanctified and perfected forever. Somebody says, well, maybe I got born again that way, but I've messed up since then. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 says, Once you believed and you were baptized into his death, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. That means vacuum packed. When you sin as a Christian, it will give Satan an inroad into your physical body to affect you. It'll give Satan an inroad into your mental, emotional part to change your thinking. But your spirit, this part of you that is holy and pure and you got a brand new nature, it's vacuum packed. Sin doesn't penetrate the cell. Your spirit retains the same righteousness and holiness that you were born again with and it never changes. And so the second reason that he gives, man, I'm just running out of time, but the second reason that he gives in this chapter he says it again down here in verse 15. After he had said all of these great things about your dead to sin. He says in verse 15, what then? Shall we sin 
because we are not under the law, but under grace? And again, the answer is God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So the second reason, the first reason is you're dead to sin. And if you were to live in the spirit, and if you knew, if you had the right identity and knew what had happened to you, you would just naturally not yield to sin anymore because sin is deadly. Sin is depressing. Sin is not fun. Sin is bad. So if you really knew what you had, you'd quit living in sin because living in holiness is better than living in sin. But the second reason he gives is that if you yield to sin, then you are yielding yourself to the author of that sin, which is Satan. Satan's the one that comes against you to steal, to kill, and destroy. And so if you yield to sin, you're giving Satan an inroad into your life. And he's, he goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. If you give Satan the opportunity, if you yield to sin, he's going to eat your lunch and pop, and pop the bag. For those of you that don't know that, you can't graduate from Caris without knowing that phrase. And so I don't yield to sin because number one, my heart's been changed. I got a brand new heart and I, I cannot sin. But then also, even beyond just my relationship with God, if I yield to sin, I'm yielding myself to Satan. And even though God's not going to impute that sin unto me, Satan will. Satan will hold my sin against me. And if possible, he will use my sin against me. If you were to take what I'm saying and say, man, Andrew says that I can't sin and that it's all grace. And so you know what? I'm going to go out here and rob a bank, get a million dollars, and they can't do anything to me. Well, no, God's not going to reject you. If you're truly born again, God won't reject you for robbing a bank, but I guarantee you men will, and they'll put you in jail. And while you're rotting in prison, you could just have a wonderful communion with God because he still loves you. He's dealing with you based on who you are in the spirit, but that's just dumber than a hammer for you to go out and live in a way that gives Satan an inroad into your life that's going to cause you and other people problems. As much as you can, you need to have self-righteousness so that you can relate to people without hurting them and reaping rejection and stuff, and also so that you can keep the door closed on the devil. So as much as you can, you need to live a holy life. But when it comes to God, you can't approach God on the basis of your holiness. You have to approach him only on who you are in Christ. I use this verse already, but John chapter 4 verse 24 says, God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. When you approach God, you have to approach him on the basis of what Jesus did for you and not what you've done. He's a spirit. He sees you in the spirit. And in the spirit, you are righteous. You got a brand new nature that is dead to sin. And in your spirit, you're as righteous and holy, as pure as Jesus.